giving me these two great chapters to speak about. They are, as you say, Mark, such wonderful chapters. And uh, when you think about the future, uh, when you read the book of Revelation, you might be thinking, oh, there's a lot of trouble ahead, there's tribulation, and there is, there's wars, there's famines, there's all kinds of terrible things happening, both in history and in the future. And we're in the midst of a pandemic and people are dying. There are things going on around us that are very serious. And of course, in different parts of the world, there are wars um, and persecutions and so on. But for most, well, I don't know about most, but many, many Christians, their life is quite normal. And so when we look at chapters 21 and 22, we're not looking at things like Armageddon or Babylon or the, the Antichrist. We're looking at the common future of every Christian. And uh, that's why I, in my book, I call the, the book Countdown to Glory, because it's not countdown to gloom and disaster. It's countdown to glory for every single Christian. Now, when, um, when we look at these two chapters, 21 and 22, we're looking at what happens after the judgment day. I don't know how you've interpreted the millennium, but at the end of chapter 19, Christ comes, the return of Christ. Then in chapter 20, you have the millennium and then the judgment day. And so in chapter 21, we're looking at what happens after this. And what we're looking at is the beginning of eternity. And the, the Bible really shows us that we are really being brought to a wonderful beginning when we get to chapter 21. And there are unfolding ages, endless ages that will, will stretch out into, into eternity. This is just the beginning. So when we come through our life, we die or Jesus comes and then there's a resurrection, and then we see this is the future. This is our future, and our future is wonderful. We live in a fallen world, and we're longing. The whole creation is groaning. There is something wrong with our world, and it's creaking along. It's a sick planet, and I believe it's not a very old planet, and it's a sick planet, and I think that the human race is incredibly sick, but there is in the midst of this on planet Earth, there is in the midst of this people on planet Earth, there is a, a special people, you and me and all the people of God, whom God is preparing for to, live, to dwell with him for eternity. So we're looking at the, the, the absolutely breathtaking future that is ours because we repented of our sins and gave our lives to Jesus Christ. We were set on a track to glorification. We know that in this life we will have forgiveness and we'll be getting learning the ways of holiness, sanctification. But beyond this life, our destination is glory. And that's the main message here in chapters 21 and 22. So I've divided the chapter up tonight into uh, five sections. I could do it all kinds of ways. But uh, the first thing I want to talk about is this phrase, all things new. Then in the second point will be the bride, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. And in this chapter 21, especially, we have a description of the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem. The third point will be the river of life. That's the beginning of chapter 22. The fourth point is when John is introduced to a glorified Christian, a person who has gone and passed into glory. And he is a Christian just like John. And we'll see what happens when he meets him. And then the fifth point will be the promises and the warnings that are in these two chapters. 
Now, we've only got half an hour and five minutes is gone already. So I don't propose to read everything in this chapter, just a few verses. Let's read a few verses at the beginning of chapter 21. Now, verse one, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Let's pause there. And we have this first declaration in these first five verses, a new heaven and a new earth. And we have the declaration, I make everything new. This is going to be a completely new world. When you think about Genesis chapters one and two, it is the counterpart to Revelation 21 and 22. They're kind of mirror images. One is the kind of opposite of the other, a new creation and the, the old creation. And if you compare them, you can see uh, the, the compa comparison. For example, in the first creation, there were seas and oceans. In this new creation, there is no sea. I don't know if you like beach holidays, but I'm sorry to disappoint you. You're not going to have one there because there won't be any sea. There won't be any sun. Wow. So <laughs> beach holidays won't be quite the thing. But in the old creation, there was day and night. In the new creation, there is no night. The old creation, sun and moon, new creation, no sun or moon, or at least no need of the sun and moon. And so we have a comparison. And you can see this is now taking up again a new creation. But there's another difference that is kind of opposite. It is that when you look at the old creation, God began with the heavens and the earth, and then he made the people, the human being, Adam and Eve, and then the, the population came. In this new creation, God is preparing the population first, here and now. God is preparing us as to be citizens of a new world. When we get to this new creation, God will not be creating angels or human, <laughs> human beings. We will pass out of this old and into the new creation. In these final chapters actually including some things from chapter 20 but in these final chapters we read a wonderful list of things that will be absent some of them are neutral like there will be no more sun or moon but here's a list of 11 things that will not be in the in the new creation the first thing is quite neutral there will be no sea what do we understand by that well the answer is there will be no divisions there will be nothing to separate people on the continents i mean if i if i had family in australia i couldn't visit them easily because of the oceans and the distance and that's one of the key things here there will be no sea and we can see we can understand from that that this is a world without division there will be no more death. Eleven things I said. No sea. No more death. There'll be no more dying. Eternal life. No sorrow. No crying. No pain. 
As you get older, sometimes older people have their share of pain. Sometimes some young people have a, a fair share of pain, but no more pain. There'll be no temple. That means no religious structures. No sun or moon. No sinners. That's, that's a good thing. There'll be no sinners, no arguments, no stealing, no murder. There'll be no sinners, no lying. There'll be no more curse. There'll be no more night, no darkness. There'll be no devil or demons. And this is a world of light and glory, a sinless world. And, and it's a beautiful world. And so the, one of the greatest things we read in these verses that we've just read is that God will himself live on this earth among his people and we understand from this that the the new cre the, the gospel is not to preach heaven we we mention it of course because it is one of the consequences of believing we talk about heaven but the choice is not between heaven and hell the choice is between sin and god sin and jesus and if we choose Jesus, we will feel at home in the new creation because the lamb is the light. And it's all about the glory of God. And the other thing we read here in these verses is that God will wipe away all tears from the eyes of his people. What will they be crying? What will we be, we be crying about? Well, I guess there'll be tears of relief. Billy Graham was asked what he would think. What would his what would, it, would his first thought be when he gets to heaven? And he said his first thought would be relief. <laughs> what a wonderful thing he's got there, and he's got that certainty. He knows he's died now, but he he knows uh that's where he's going he said that when i die you'll read in the newspapers i'm dead don't believe it he said i'll be more alive than ever and uh but he said there may be tears of relief of the all the struggle and the strife that we've gone through in this life maybe there'll be some sadness that we'll some things some things we'll have left behind people we won't see again there will be many tears to shed but God will wipe away our tears and sorrow and mourning will pass away forever. That's the first thing. Behold, I make all things new, a new world. And when you try and understand this new world, all I can say is it's going to be a world that you cannot imagine. I believe one of the things about this chapter, it kind of blows your mind and what I would say is that if, if I could say there are going to be a um, hundred new colors that you've never seen before, uh, you say to me, well, what, what colors are they? I say, well, I, I haven't seen them yet. <laughs> but there's going to be a depth and a richness and a variety and a beauty about the new creation when we get there. This is the new creation. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I want to talk about is the New Jerusalem, the Lamb, the Lamb's Bride. And when you look at this New Jerusalem come down, really that's from verse 9 onwards, he describes a city. Remember we talked about Babylon, I think I talked about Babylon with you. That's that sinful city. This is a holy city. And let me just tell you a few things. I won't, won't be exhaustive. But this city and the, the lamb, the lamb's bride, is clothed in glory and a brightness that emanates from within the hearts of God's people. There are 12 gates to this city, but they are open day and night. There are no dangers or enemies that can interact with human beings. There are 12 angels at the gates and we will see angels freely and they will be visible and they will interact with us. And there are 12 foundations to this city. The foundations named after the apostles. And that teaches me that the foundations of that city 
are being laid by apostolic truth now. I am, the foundations are being laid in your life and my life. And that's because of the ministry of the apostles preaching faithfully the cross, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and laying these amazing foundations in your heart and my heart. We are building, God is building a kingdom that has foundations in our lives now. And the foundations will be adorned with precious stones. You can read here about all the different precious stones they are. And these are things that are being worked in our lives now. Precious qualities being put into our lives. The other thing, this is a huge city. It's a 1,500 miles in length, breadth, and height. Some have wondered whether it's a cube, because that, that would be logical in one way. But I don't think it's a cube. I think it's probably got, it's probably like a, a cone standing up, going round. It's, it's, it's a, got a high point like a mountain. And the city will be like a mountain. And so it will have height. And uh, this huge city, 1,500 miles square and 1,500 miles high. The walls will be 72 meters high. The walls around the city, that's why I don't think it's a cube. There will be 72 meters high wall. That's the equivalent of a 24 story building at three meters per story. That's 24 story building. That's the walls of the city. And the city will be made of gold, of clear glass, as clear as glass. And that's a symbol of the character and the, the beautiful quality of the inhabitants filled with the divine presence and uh, it's a wonderful picture when we look at this the new jerusalem the bride and so let's move on now to chapter 22 we've seen there we've got this new creation a new heaven a new earth and then coming down onto this earth we have the people of god as a holy city and then we turn to chapter 22 and we see he then sees something different. He doesn't actually relate these two things together. In chapter 21, he's seen a new creation and he's seen the new Jerusalem. He's seen the bride of Christ with all this glory upon her. That's us. And then in chapter 22, he sees a river of life. He sees the throne again and he sees a river coming out of the throne. And I often think when I, when I, um, when I think of this river flowing out of the throne of God, I always think that um, uh, when, when the engineers get to heaven, I don't know if there's any engineers in the meeting here, but if there's an engineer, you know what engineers will do when they see the throne? They will look at it and they'll say, they'll go and look behind the throne to see where the water's coming in so that it can flow out. Because why? Because that's logical. Everything on the earth, has a cause and an effect. So if there's water flowing out, there must be an inflow. But that's not the case with this river. This river is flowing out of God because God is producing this river from himself. He is the source of everything. And no matter how much he pours out, he is not diminished and he is not weakened, this river. And when you look at this river, it's got the tree of life in the midst of it and on the banks of it. And the trees are they're on the banks of this river of life that flows from the throne of God. They have healing qualities. And the tree of life is, of course, most of all for us, we know the cross of Calvary. And uh, that we, can, we are eating from that tree of life already. But this will be another dimension of the tree of life because we will not eat of this tree of life just for salvation, but for, to nourish and to fellowship with God for eternity. In one sense, the communion is a picture of our salvation. That's true. But it's also a picture of what will continue on into all eternity. Perhaps the greatest statement in chapter 22 for me is that they shall see his face that's in chapter 22 verse 4 they shall see 
God's face. We will see the face of God. We'll see that river. We'll see the throne. We'll see God on the throne and we'll see his face. When we see the face of God, the sweetest, most awesome moment of our existence, because in the faith of God is holiness, is love, and there's pulsating life coming from the person of God. We will look and gaze and we will cover our faces at the brightness of the glory of God, the unapproachable glory of God in the face of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. When we get there, we shall understand God, not to the point where there's nothing left to know. We will never know God so to the point where we've exhausted him. He's inexhaustible. But we shall know God as we are known. We shall have such a thorough, clear knowledge of God. We shall be transformed. And the Bible says when we see him, we shall be like him. We shall be in the image of of our god and the depths of the godhead are not like any three-dimensional sight we've ever seen to gaze on god is to gaze on an infinity of transcendent glory as we behold god in his unveiled splendor the riches of his being are imparted to us the the depths of peace and love and the power of his holiness pour into us and we shall know God as we are, as, as, he, as, 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 as he knows us, we shall know him. So that's the third point, the river of life. So we've seen all things new and new creation. We've seen the bride of Christ coming down. That's us with all those wonderful qualities. We've seen the river of life flowing out of the throne. And now my fourth point, he meets a fellow servant in chapter 22. He says, uh, Verse 8, uh, I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you don't do that, because don't you recognize me? I'm Dave Weatherly. <laughs> I don't know if any of you, any of you know Dave, remember Dave Weatherly. I'm trying to think of, of somebody who's gone ahead, who's somebody who's died that you know. Um, uh, I'm sure there's lo loads of people. I can't think. David Porson. David Porson. I'm David Porson because he says, I am of your, your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets. I was your preacher. Don't you remember I preached at your conference and now I'm, I'm in glory. And he, he, the glory was so great that he wanted to worship this belief. He says, no, 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 I'm not an angel. I'm, I'm just like you, but I'm now in glory. And uh, that's the wonder of this, this particular event. He sees the glory of God in, the, in this servant who is now glorified and transformed in his, in, the, in his presence. And he's amazed at what he sees. He cannot recognize the person because the glory is so great. I'm sure he, we will recognize people, but it will, it will be so un amazing to see the light of God. Of course, we can come into some measure of this. I think one of the things I remember once preaching in a meeting and I saw a person's face in the meeting glowing. It felt like it was a physical glow, but it was just the glory of God on a human face and that can happen to us even now the glory can come down and and uh, what do i how do i define glory i define glory by this simple phrase it is overwhelming it's more than us it's a dimension of god and his presence that is breathtaking you can't stand in the glory it's so amazing mm. so we come to my fifth point in this section when you look through this this uh, section and uh, we've only gone through a fleeting glance at these two chapters but when you look at these these, these two, two chapters you will find promises and you'll also find warnings because these chapters are not are, are of course of things that are yet to happen this is the future and so he's warning people there are there are i think about uh, 
four warnings I've counted. Uh, there may be more, but I've counted four main warnings and I've counted four promises. And I'll give you the warnings first and then end on the promises. But the warnings are these. He, in chapter 21, he says there'll be no sinners there. And he says, because the reason is because the verse eight, the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, immoral people, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. And you can see here the warning. This is the glory of the new creation, the glory of God's people, which will be transfigured, transformed in that final day. But there's a warning. What happens? And then in chapter 22, verse 11, he says, there's a day coming when all choices made in this life will be fixed forever and made permanent. So in chapter 22, verse 11, he says, let him who is unjust be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he, he's warning here that the choices we make in this life will one day be confirmed and made permanent. If we choose Christ, we, that choice will be made permanent. We will have him forever. If we choose sin after this life, it will be made permanent. And that's the warning. And then in chapter 22, verse 15, he says that those who are immoral and murderers will be excluded from the tree of life. The final warning is in chapter 22, verse 18 and 19, which says, don't add to this book. Don't take away from this book. Of course, he's referring to the book of Revelation, but also to the whole Bible. We can apply it to the whole Bible. Don't add. Don't take away. If you add to this book, you, God will add to you the plagues that are written in this book. If you take away from this book, God will take away your ble the blessings that are, that are promised in this book. When I read that, I wonder how liberal scholars can take away so systematically the truth that is declared in the pages of the Bible and still claim to be Christian. I, I think they should be trembling when they read that verse. We must not take away. So that's the four warnings. Let me now come to the, to the promises. I have here two promises I want to give you. They're similar. In chapter 21, verses 6 and 7, he says this. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He's going to give us the water of life. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my, my son. And it's the, the force of that promise is it's worth it to do battle and to fight for, the, for the, the precious promises of God, to lay hold of them, because we are overcomers. We are not of those who give up. We're not of those who surrender our conscience. We are not of those who surrender to the, to the spirit of the world. We are those who fight for the faith that is delivered to us and given to us. We are overcomers. And there is a challenge in, the, in those verses. And then the final promise in chapter uh, 22, verse 17. The spirit and the bride, that's the Holy Spirit, and the bride, that's the church. That's you and me. That's God's people. We say, come. And that's the great message of the, the great word that comes through the Holy Spirit and through the people of God. Come. And where are we to come? Let him who hears say come. Now, you notice what he says. He wants you to say come because the spirit is exhorting you to come and the God's people are exhorting you to come. And he says, now you exhort yourself to say come. And that's the, the great turning point. When you start exhorting yourself, there are some people you have to go and follow them up and try and bring them and try and persuade them. And they're reluctant and they kind of sit on the fence. And they, But there comes a moment when they say to themselves, you know what? This is the way for me. And we start to say to ourselves, come. 
and we're not now being led by others. We are ourselves pursuing in the way of righteousness. And we are saying to ourselves, come. And why, what do we? And then it says, let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. When we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, there is immediately, on the very first day we believe, there is something first to trickle some droplets of, of the holy, precious Spirit of God. This living water touches our souls and we are and our thirst is slaked. This is the great exhortation at the end of this great, these two great chapters. Come, drink freely. That means without payment. Uh, just take. It's paid for. It's fully paid for. We can drink of the water of life. And it's that water that makes us if you like, people who are fit for that new creation. It's drinking of the waters of the Holy Spirit as we bow before Jesus Christ, believing in him, giving him our lives, that the water of the Holy Spirit begins to change us and make us new. That's something that begins in this world as we come and drink the water of life. Well, we've gone through those five overview points. And what you can see is that there is a world fast approaching. Now, the end of the world is approaching. Judgment day is coming. But beyond that is the new creation and the people of God being prepared to dwell with God forever in a world as we have described. Well, we've come to the end. Let's just pray and then I will hand, hand back to Mark. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I come again and I drink of that river that flows from the throne. It touches me, it reaches me, and I drink of this life-giving, life-transforming river of life. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray for everyone in this meeting tonight. Let each one drink right now full, deep drafts of the Spirit of God, Fill us all with the Spirit. Change us, ready us for the things that are coming. And we pray this prayer for ourselves and for each other in the wonderful name of Jesus, Savior. Amen. God bless you. Wonderful.